Hello everybody and welcome back to video number four of uh, phylogenies in which we're going to be looking at phylogenetic characters. So phylogenies, in order to build a tree of a hypothesis of evolutionary relationships, we need characters. And those can be morphological or they can be molecular as we're going to discover in this section. So if you think back to video number two, we talked about cladistics. This is the special form of systematics whereby we arrange things by, um, by understanding their evolutionary relationships. And cladistics has a number of underlying assumptions about characters in it. Cladistics assumes that characters change or are acquired over time. It also assumes that any group of organisms are related by common descent a fairly safe assumption, as we have learnt about the Tree of Life in video number one um, of this video series. It assumes that character similarities and differences reflect evolutionary history. This is an assumption, and it is one which is, in, um, in some instances, not correct, but the, the analysis allows us to kind of um, to build on uh, to build on the characters that we've got and to work out which character statements may be incorrect. Um, the example that I showed you earlier of this fourth limb of tetrapods and relatives, so these are marine relatives of the tetrapods, um, shows that these are actually relatively good assumptions in many cases. We can homologize the, the different bits that make up the, um, the limb across a wide range of different groups. And so this um, supports some of the assumptions that I just highlighted that cladistics makes. So let's dig in a little deeper and let's look at characters. So molecular characters are generally nuclear-based data. So it's a string of the letters that make up DNA um, that is found in an organism. We can use different sorts of DNA to build um, phylogenies though. So um, we can, for example, um, use DNA sequences that come from either nuclear DNA, so in a, a eukaryote that comes from the DNA in the nucleus, which is the most common um, form of molecular data, or the central, the uh, not central, but the chromosome that we find in bacteria is another typical place that we look for DNA um, for characters. But it can also be, for example, mitochondrial DNA. So this would be um, the DNA that's drawn from an organelle. So we're talking about um, eukaryotes again here, and we know that in eukaryotes, we covered this in the first lecture, we have the nucleus that has DNA, but also we have these all of these organelles that um, have their origins in, in endosymbiosis, and num a number of those still have their, DNA, their own DNA. And early, especially, in the world of understanding phylogenetics, um, it was this DNA that we used to um, try and reconstruct the broad tree of life. Um, that's what a lot of phylogeny started with, because uh, this is organelle-based DNA, because it's relatively stable and it's relatively slowly evolving. And that makes it useful for big phylogenetic questions across um, large amounts of time. Earlier phylogenies also used RNA. So you can see an image of DNA on the right-hand side here, and an RNA which serves a number of other functions in the cell. And some phylogenies still do. This RNA that we use for phylogenies is typically drawn from the ribosome of the cell. That's the bit that makes proteins. There are lots of, of ribosomes in a cell. And that's a relatively popular source of RNA, as it's a relatively slow-evolving um, kind of... a uh, part of the uh, genetic architecture of a cell. But in recent years, using this RNA has become slightly less common, I think it's fair to say, to build phylogenies. Some phylogenies alternatively use the amino acid sequences that can be derived from DNA and RNA. And there are a number of reasons you may want to do that. Of course, all of these kind of sources of data are related to each other because they can all be drawn, for example, from the same cell or the same organism. Once we have got DNA, then we need to be able to identify homologous molecular sites. So we want to be able to essentially identify the same nucleotide position. And that's established through something called sequence alignment. So you can see the example I used earlier from a histone gene. These are actually amino acids on the top left-hand side here. By this, we uh, what we actually mean, sequence alignment, is that we work out which sites are homologous to each other by basically um, moving the positions of the strings relative to each other um, and we can assume, and this is an assumption, that if we move strings of, of DNA bases or 
um, amino acids relative to each other and minimize the differences between those two sequences, um, between say two different species, that the bases that are different represent changes or mutations in homologous sites. So you minimize the difference and you assume then anything that is still different at a particular site is a result of a mutation. So life isn't always quite so simple though, um, because uh, we have algorithms that do this and they're very clever. I actually I think they're really, really interesting. Um, but those algorithms have to deal with insertions of bits of DNA and also deletions. So you can get additions and deletions, meaning that um, sometimes your strings of DNA bases aren't actually the same length. And so that makes it significantly harder computationally to deal with this alignment problem. With lots of data though, uh, as shown in this bottom image here, it's possible in um, in most instances to align sequences. So it, here you can see some amino acids that are colored in conserved regions to make them easier to see by eye. If you're interested in how those algorithms actually work, perhaps a life in bioinformatics awaits from you, uh, for you. It's a really interesting field that deals with these problems on a day-to-day -day basis. So I can highly recommend looking into the, to that if you think it's interesting. So that's a very quick introduction to molecular characters. There's quite, quite a lot more going on there. But given the nature of this course, um, morphological characters is really going to be our focus here, as that is, in particular, how we deal with fossils. So morphological characters are the things that we uh, use to understand the evolutionary relationships of fossils. And morphological characters are essentially things that we create based upon observing morphology, that we think captures an interesting character or trait that may tell us something about the evolutionary relationships in a group. So a classical example, such as that one shown on the left here, of a morphological character is the absence or the presence of a feature. So in this example, we've got the um, lower temporal fenestra. This is a hole in the skull behind the eye that is found in some but not all um, tetrapods. And we can mark it as presence or absence and the presence or absence of this feature in all of the skulls of species that we're interested in can be coded and that becomes our morphological character. But there are also conditional characters that we can do. So here's a character um, in the middle here that tells apart the two main dinosaur groups. That's the position of a bone called the pubis. It points forward in one group, you can see it in orange here, and backwards in another group. So we can use this to define a conditional character. The pubis direction can either be anterior ventral or posterior. There are also things called multi-state characters shown on the right side hand side here. These are where you have multiple conditions that you can code into a single character. So for example, we can in the tetrapods code for the presence of no temporal fenestra, this hole, or we can code for one, or we can code for two. And we can do that in an ordered fashion. So we can say um, that in order to go from none through to two, you have to go via one, or we can do that in uh, an unordered fashion. So you can say it's possible to go from none to two without having to go via one. And that impacts upon how we build the tree later. So those are some examples of morphological characters. And as you can see, this is quite a, a kind of uh, intellectual exercise that um, sometimes uh, people suggest lacks objectivity. Um, they may be correct, but it's the best that we have when it comes to dealing with morphological characters. And that's the only way we have of dealing with um, fossils. So, you know, it is what it is, I guess. In order to be systematic, to try and make sure we're as objective as possible, we tend to use a grammar to describe the characters, as shown here. So we typically have, as shown in green, an anatomical feature, and then we have a series of state descriptions of that feature, which should be ex as explicit as possible. So anyone reading this description is able to use that character and understand where it's coming from. This may all sound relatively straightforward, you're like, well, yeah, obviously, absence or presence of a hole in the skull is something that you can just look. But in order to establish characters, we have to try and be rigorous and, as I've mentioned, make sure our character states are really, really clear. And that isn't always as easy as it may sound. So if we were looking, for example, at characters that 
are something to do with the integument of snakes, the covering of snakes. You can see lots of snakes here. Apologies if you're scared of snakes. Um, there are some borderline character states we would need to consider. So we could have a character for stripes. So that's uh, stripes, absent or present. Brilliant. Nice and simple, right? That one. But you see, these ones have stripes here. All good. And that one is particularly a very handsome snake, has stripes. But also some of them, like this one, have spots. So we could have spots, absent and present. But then that we would have to ask, when does a spot become a stripe? How do we define that? What is the difference between a spot and a stripe? So an, an obvious way to try and, for example, um, delineate this, maybe the aspect ratio of that feature. If it's long and thin, we could consider it a sp stripe. And if it's short and fat, we can consider it a spot. But we probably want to have those as separate things that we consider in the integument of a snake. And colour is even more difficult. You can see there are lots and lots of different colours here, but some animals have more than one colour. So how do we actually code a colour if we were coding the integument of these snakes? And the answer is that's probably quite a bad character. We probably don't want to do that. And of course, colours are sub subjective. Those of you that were in the lecture for this course um, got to hear me pointing out that I see colours differently through my left and my right eye. So there is a subjective nature to colours. So... Often, in cases such as these, we try and graph or otherwise quantify the feature and make character definitions based on that. So, it's really important to think about how we formulate our characters when we're doing a morphological phylogeny. We also need to consider that at times, one character is contingent upon another, so it relies upon another. A famous, for phylogeny at least, thought experiment is the red tail, blue tail problem. So this is a situation that happens a lot with morphology, and this is a fake example. You can see my beautifully uh, photoshopped fox on the left here to remove its tail. But we may be um, coding uh, this organism for its morphology, and we may be able to say, okay, this has got a tail. Oh, sorry, this one doesn't have a tail. Um, those that do have a tail have a red white tail or a blue tail. And so there's this question of... How do we code this? Is it better to code this as a single character with a uh, no tail or red tail or blue tail? Or is it better to what we call atomize the character to say tail is absent or present? And then for those organisms that have a, color, a tail to code its color. And it turns out there's been quite a lot of research on this in the last 10 or 15 years. That the best way is to try and um, split up our characters as well as possible and do what you can see on this slide here, which is code for the absence or the presence of a tail. And then in those organisms that have a tail, code for the colour. In those organisms that don't have a tail, we code that as inapplicable, creating a contingent character. This tail colour character is contingent upon having a tail. Now, how we deal with that contingent character is a whole can of worms, which I will not open here, but just bear in mind that this is how we normally do this. Once we have these characters, these need to be coded into a phylogenetic matrix. So this is a, just a matrix of characters such as that shown on the left hand here. So these characters aren't particularly well defined, but they'll do for our purposes. And you can see, for example, the absence or presence of fins, legs or warm bloodiness are all featured in this matrix, which is just a list of our characters against a list of are different organisms, in this case, shark, salmon, frog, lizard, chicken, and mouse. So let's dig into these for, for very quickly to, to think about the characters just a tiny bit more. So Bone, as shown here, number four, is an example of not a very good character. So Bone is marked as absent in uh, sharks. Shark are, sharks are cartilaginous fish, they lack bone, but is present in all of the remaining organisms in this phylogeny. That doesn't tell us anything about the interrelationships of these groups. All it really tells us is that sharks are different to everything else. Um, and so we can't really use that to say much about the, um, the phylogeny unless we add an outgroup, a thing that tells us what the original state of the feature was. We'll get onto that in a minute. In contrast to that, um, we could, for example, look at the character legs. Now this is a pretty good character because we can see that shark and salmon lack legs, whereas frogs, lizards, chicken, and mice all have legs, 
And so that's telling us something about the interrelationships between these groups. There's a shared character here between shark and salmon, the lack of legs, and a shared one here between these four taxa there. So this is an example of a good character that's telling us something about the interrelationships of these groups here. You can see these characters marked on the tree here. So you can see um, that uh, changes in the state of the character are marked on a tree of, of life or in either black or, or white, depending on where they, they are, gains or losses of those characters. And this, of course, helps me illustrate also that bone, um, the nature of the bone character. So, for example, we could have a, a gain of bone here, shared by all of these organisms, or maybe this thing here had bone, and that's been lost on the way to sharks. That's why bone doesn't tell us much about the interrelationships on these, um, of these particular organisms. That brings us to an idea of character informativeness. So a good character is one that records homology. This is the concept that we've already met in video number three. Here are two examples of not so useful characters. In character, um, well, I guess character one, the one here shown that's all zeros, if we map mark that or map that onto all of the penitential trees of these four taxa, we find out that because these are all zeros, there are no changes in character on that tree. It tells no us nothing about the interrelationships of these organisms. And similarly, when um, um, species A has a character coded one, but the remaining things have a character coded zero, as we met with the, the previous example, all that tells us is that there's been a change between these three and A, but it doesn't tell us much about the interrelationships of this group. However, if we have a character that's present in A and B, but absent in C or D, there's only one tree here which allows just a single character change, and that is the one that's shown on the right-hand side here. Any other tree shape, such as those, the, the other two that are shown here, require a transformation of that character. So when we map that on the tree, we can see that these two imply a lot character, sorry, these two topologies, tree shapes, imply a uh, a significantly larger number of character changes than this one here. So that's great. And in the practical that you did in class, uh, you kind of met the kind of the how we formulate characters to try and make them informative. So I hope that was useful. And in our final video, the next video, um, just down the page as you're watching this, we're going to be looking at how you get from the characters to building a tree. So I'll see you there very, very shortly.